the, the toxicity levels on our planet are going up and to appreciate the purity and the clarity of these elements while we have them. Exactly. And also to remember that all those same elements are what makes up our body. So if we honor those elements, not only with our breath and our prayers, um, honor ourselves, because we're made up of that. Hello and welcome to another edition of Chi Time, your conscious living show with me, Clara Apollo. And I have for you a very special guest here, all the way from America, well, Mexico, really, we have Grace Sesma, or Grace Alvarez Sesma. Have I pronounced that correctly, Grace? Yes, you have. Yeah. Who is a curandissimo. I can't even say that properly either. <laughs> I've been practicing it and it came out all wrong. Um, Grace, an indigenous Mexican healer, an educator and a leader. And honestly, I just can't wait to learn with you. I really can't. So welcome to the show, Grace. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for inviting me to be with you and to share a little bit about my background and to share a little bit about what I've learned on this journey. Um, in our communities, a traditional healer, is oftentimes given the title of curandera. And a curandera is a female healer. The, uh, the medicine itself, the way that it's practiced by some people in Mexico is called curanderis. And that is because it is a, due to colonization, various types of indigenous cosmology, philosophy, knowledge has come together over the hundreds of years since the invasion of Mexico by the Spanish to come together in a very lovely and good, respectful way to transform into this medicine that we call curanderismo. Curanderismo, here we go. And I can say it when you say it, curanderismo. Oh, it's lovely. So how did you, were, you, were you born into this? Is it something that is part of your, your ancestry? I mean, how did it choose you? It's a, it's a really long story and I'm gonna share some, some of it at more length when I'm there for the presentation for the platica that we're gonna be having on June 11. Like many Mexican, um, people, especially those of us who are still in touch with aspects of our native roots, our indigenous roots, we grow up using a lot of the knowledge, the remedios, the remedies, the house remedies, uh, in terms of herbal teas, um, certain foods to eat, when to eat the foods, especially as a woman during certain times of the month that we're not allowed to eat certain foods. So I grew up in that culture. My mom never would have called herself a curandera as none of my aunties would have called themselves a curandera because the way I was taught that that, that, that title can only be earned by someone who is truly serving all of the community and not just the family. And it is typically someone who is willing to put the time and the sacrifices of not just the, the time that's expended, but also the potential for danger, spiritual danger, physical danger of being in training for the deeper, more profound aspects of being a curandera. So to circle around to how I learned it, my mother most of the time you know, did her healing work at home with us kids. Uh, with the herbal teas, chamomile teas. We always had a garden wherever we went. There was a garden with the herbs that she used. I had an auntie in uh, Mexicali, Baja California. That's where we lived originally. And one of our, my aunties was the person to whom people brought their babies when they were colicky, unable to sleep, um, maybe were nauseous uh, and listless. And this is a a cultural illness that is known as um, caída de mollera. This is usually just for smaller babies. So that translates into the fallen fontanel. 
and she was very, very good at healing babies with this particular ailment. So she's someone that I looked up with, and now that I'm way older and decided to really take this path in a very serious way and to really live it and not shy away from it the way I, I felt when I was quite young, I wish I had really paid more attention to her. Uh, so she did that. You know, I think that that's a lot of people's experience. You know, when you're younger, you're a little rebellious. And, and especially those of us who, out of love and concern for our well-being, our parents want us to be a little more assimilated so that we don't go through the trials and tribulations that my great-grandparents would have, would have done, would have experienced. So in sometimes in trying to be assimilated here in the United States, um, we in our early years, we have a tendency to push away some of our cultural mm. practices. And then as we get older, uh, we realize that we are part of a very rich, wise, and much needed way of living. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head there. Rich and wise and much needed. And this is being so called for, particularly now, um, across the world, this, this need to recognize our part of being in nature and being responsible in nature. And I'd like to ask you what you, what you feel about this, this call back to the indigenous wisdom and have you seen this happen over your lifetime? I mean, more people actually asking and wanting to really mm -hmm. understand more. Absolutely. And, you know, all, all the experiences that we have, I, whether it happens, like my first experience really was when I was a child, not only with my family, but in the dream time, having a lot of dreams and visions uh, about being asked to to do certain things as I grew older. Mm. And I get a lot of telephone calls, emails uh, from young people wanting to meet with me, wanting to discuss their own feeling of being called back to the more traditional way of living. And I think some of young people are much smarter and wiser than I ever was at their age. They recognize that there is such a need, uh, not just a need, but that it is critical to their well-being and the well-being of the generations that come after us to really embrace and learn in the indigenous philosophy of their parents and grandparents and their ancestors because they acknowledge that the way things are now are not beneficial to anyone, not to themselves, not to the earth, not to the animals, the, the birds, our mountains, and particularly our water, our rivers, are in such critical danger. So a lot of these young people are really understanding that they really get it, and they're willing to do what it takes to protect it. Yeah. So when they come to me in that way, I am more than happy to meet with them and to mentor them as best as I can. Exactly. What can we do as individuals to to help, to make a difference, to take care of ourselves first in a holistic way, but also to make the, the right choices in our communities and, and for the world. Absolutely. Um, people ask me what they can do. So I think it, it depends on where you live. First of all, is that you should know your area intimately <clears throat> as much as possible at any rate. Know where you're living. Who, who are the sacred beings in your area? What is your particular sacred philosophy and sacred way of being that your ancestors held dear? Because we all have ancestral ways in all parts of the world. Instead of people searching to the Americas if they live in Iceland, for example, why do they not first look where they live and see where their help is needed. Relearn your traditional ways. And then you can start really from a very rooted place doing your part to bring 
to help bring our world into a better place. I know that there are scientists who say that we're way beyond the critical um, phase, but there's a matter of balance and there's a matter of acknowledging that yes, we're in a critical place worldwide that we need to do something, but also keep that hope and that commitment to do whatever it is that you can do from wherever you are. That's the important piece to me. Yeah. There, there is something about um, the indigenous culture of Europe mm -hmm. has largely been eradicated. And mm -hmm. as you were speaking there about regaining your culture, I felt a deep, deep sadness that of all the atrocities and all the wounding that has gone on, that has done its best to, 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 to wipe out a lot of the, the European culture. I think this is why we're so interested in the, in the indigenous communities that are actually up and running and still keeping it all going. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I know, I hear what you say about how it needs to be of the land that you're on. I really hear that, but there are, there are cross-cultural common denominators, aren't there? Mm -hmm. There are some, I don't consider myself to be um, a, a practitioner from other cultures. I can only speak for my own. Mm. Um, and since I'm not that, at least from my perspective, perspective not knowledgeable enough about what the uh, European uh, tradition would be, I don't know where they, the crossover is. I just know intuitively that there is because that's how indigenous people are all around the world. We come together and we go like, oh yeah, that looks similar to what we do. And this is, you know, how we do things. And it's not exactly the same, but it's a little similar. The difference is that we respect each other enough to not take from one another without being offered first. And that's where we run into a lot of problems because there's so many people, um, and I'll speak to the people here, you know, who are in the United States and some, and now more and more in Mexico, what I'm seeing is um, people, young people who are just desperate and they don't understand that it takes years to learn about our traditional ways and that it takes patience and humility and um, a, a requirement to not start changing things just because you're not willing to do the work to go deeper. Mm -hmm. so there's, there's all of that that has to take place before someone can even think of making changes to any part of our traditional culture, whoever called, whosoever culture it belongs to. Um, because they don't have enough experience. Yeah. You know, I, I questioned things when I first started, what, 35 years ago, probably. And it took years and I, to, for me to realize, oh, that's why they told me to do that that way. <laughs> yeah. When it does, it evolves in a kind of spiral as you learn, doesn't it? Yeah. The learning changes, but the practice does not. Ah, okay. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. That what I've learned, I don't change. I do it the way I was taught because yeah. elders have reasons why they do things and why things have survived 500 years of genocide. Right. So some have survived. And I'd like to come back to the, the power of ritual and ceremony with you after we've played the track that you've chosen. Oh, no. Let's first of all have a cup of tea, yeah? So you were mentioning growing herbs in the garden. <laughs> so <laughs> Chicano Park. <laughs> tea, tea Park. And what, what, what tea are you drinking there, Grace? I'm drinking chamomile tea. Okay. okay. It takes me back to when I was little and my mom would say, Mija, go outside and gather some of the manzanilla so I can make you some manzanilla tea. And it's, you know, it's a little relaxing, but to me more than all, especially because today is Mexican Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day in Mexico. Oh, wow. So I always celebrate my mom and she passed away um, last year. Oh. So to me, you know, it's like bringing her here. Oh, blessings on you and your mother on Mexican Mother's Day. Thank you. No, oh, thank you, sweetheart. Um, 
you've chosen a delightful tune for us to play, listeners. I wonder if you would introduce it and explain why you've chosen this particular track, please, Grace. Well, I chose this track because it is part of an album by my friend uh, David Young and Elena um, Claver. And they put together these, this beautiful album, Council Ceiling. And it's various songs that they sing to honor the four directions, to honor the ancestors. There's various, um, the grandmother earth, you know, the water. So this track is one of my favorites. It's one of the introductions into honoring the four directions. Thank you. We'll come back with you after this. I love that track, Grace. Thank you so much for sharing it. It's like, as soon as I played it, it just went, it sort of rolled around my sister as if it was mm -hmm. already in there and the music kind of found it and brought it out. Very, very... Um, it's beautiful. Yeah, really beautiful. So thank you for that. Thank you. Well, I'm grateful to my friends for, for sharing their gifts with, with all of us. They're, they're yeah. wonderful people. So do you use music um, and rhythm in, in the ritual and ceremony that you do? Not necessarily. Um, when I work, um, my foundation is, you can see, my Boposhkomi and my Gopal, my Sage, my, uh, we call them medicines. Mm -hmm. And so I, I always start with, with prayer, with offering the, the medicine to the to the ancestors, the four directions, the grandfather, son. And once I do that, then <clears throat> I begin by having a conversation with those who come to see me. I mean, it's, I, it's really important for me to establish an intention for the healing. And to me, prayer is a form of setting intention, particularly because our, our work is sacred work. Those who come to see me, come to me with confianza. That's the, the, the Spanish word for a form of trust. Mm -hmm. And in, when we use it in the context of curanderismo, confianza means not just that I, I, I am comfortable with you and that I trust you, but it's a deeper, more profound feeling of acknowledging that you know that the curandera is going to treat you like a sacred person mm. with respect, honoring what is shared, the confidentiality of what is being shared, um, honoring the wounds, honoring and respecting stories that are sometimes pretty horrific to hear. They are trusting me not just with their story, they're trusting me with their spirit. They're trusting me with their heart. That's why this is sacred medicine. Mm -hmm. And I do my best to rise to the occasion through prayer and to hold the space for them in a way that they know that they are safe that they're not going to be disrespected, that they're not going to be touched inappropriately, that they are not going to be made to feel less than or to encourage a feeling of victimhood. Mm. Because if they're coming to see me, they're courageous and they're willing to do the work, which is not easy. And they're willing to take advice and they're willing to make changes in their life. Absolutely. It, it takes courage. It really takes courage. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. And the, the power of having your story heard in that sacred way, that is a medicine. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and is there a, what is the most common thing people come to see you about? Can you share that with us? Uh, in the last few years, it has really um, been more deeply, unfortunately, into the effects of someone 
who maybe was um, shared with members of family and outside of the family for sexual purposes. A lot of, a lot of that. Or uh, I've had a couple of young women who, whose boyfriends unfortunately um, took them away from their family only to place them in, a, in with groups of people who sexually trafficked them or they were um, basically locked in, in a room and men were brought in to rape them. I use the word rape very deliberately because some people say, oh, well, she was you know, sexually uh, molested or they used her sexually. Let's call it what it is. It's rape and it's torture. Um, that um, I have a lot of families who come to see me for family counseling, which is uh, also an, another component to my work. Uh, those are the major ones that I see. I see people for um, other emotional issues or long-standing issues of trauma uh, that have nothing to do with sexual abuse or trafficking. Uh, some women come to see me for help to um, process having had to terminate a pregnancy for their own, obviously, personal reasons. Others, because they are having a lot of anxiety, um, stress. So it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a gamut of different reasons for why people come to see me. Mm -hmm. Some of it is also, obviously, some physical. Mm -hmm. but, but a lot of people come to me more for the emotional trauma mm -hmm. of past experiences. Mm -hmm. Wow. So an, another side, or so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Grace Sesmer is here with us on Chi Time. And you are also a, a cultural educator. So as well as having your practice, you mm -hmm. also share your knowledge out in, in the mainstream. Where, where do you get called to and, and what's, what's that, what is that like? Well, I want to clarify that it's not a how-to. I don't do how to become a curandera workshops. As an educator, I educate, um, perhaps somebody might call me at a company, may call me because they're having communication problems with members of their team because the members of the team may be indigenous or Mexican indigenous and their worldview and is different from the dominant culture, the American dominant culture. So that is an aspect of education. I, uh, recently, I did a, um, a, a presentation at a university on our Dia de los Muertos. Uh, that is a beautiful holiday that so many people around the world have really brought into their heart. And I love to share that because it's really important to us in our in our culture, in our community, that it not be confused with Halloween or be confused with other um, holidays around the world that, where cultures honor their ancestors. It's completely different. It has its roots in uh, the Aztec culture way back pre Cuauhtémoc, pre-contact uh, time. So to me, that's really important to share how the origin of Dia de Muertos, the Day of the Dead. Um, it's important for me to share its roots, how it's evolved, how it's made its way from central Mexico all the way to other places in Mexico as the Spaniards moved along and brought people with them, oftentimes against their will, but brought their culture along. And then that, that also started changing other native nations where the Spanish continued moving through. So to me, that's, I love sharing that part and I feel very strongly about it as a, as a Mexican and indigenous woman, that it be respected. So the best way for me to do that is to share with you, how do you, if you want to bring this home with you, because it's not part of your culture, I want to share with you ways in which you can do that in a very respectful way, in a way that still honors its origin. That's what's really important. So I love teaching that. So that's part of being a cultural educator for me. Okay. 
How interesting. And I noticed that you have um, a painting here. Those of you who are watching this on the video are probably thinking, is that Frida Kahlo behind Grace Sesma there? Or, or who have you got behind you? Yes, that is a painting of Frida Kahlo. And I really, I, um, you probably can't see it but about from the glare, but she's holding a beautiful Paloma, a dove. Oh. And to me, that painting just has such a soothing feel to it, a very peaceful feeling. Mm. Um, people really like that a lot. So mm. and I like the vibrant colors. Yeah. yeah. No, she's and, really. And really I respect good. all the hard challenges that she was able to, to, um, move beyond and became a thriving woman a, a, a you know a trailblazer totally. so i think that that's really wonderful yeah absolutely that no matter what challenges that you've got if you've got creativity that's coursing through you you will find a way to birth it into the world right amazing so the importance of ritual and ceremony in our lives grace just before we go i mean we 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 we're getting close, but I've been wanting to ask you about this, um, th that it gives you, what do ritual and ceremony give a person in this day and age? Why is it so important to consider? Mm -hmm. I think one of the main things is that it reminds one to, that we can move beyond the challenges that we're seeing around us. For me, it's a reminder of my responsibility, my sacred responsibility to honor all that lives, to honor all of creation. And by doing so, it reminds me that I have tasks to do in the world, not only through my healing work in my office, but the healing work that we're all called to do in the larger world. It calls me to remember that I am related to all that lives. I am called to remember to honor water, air, fire, earth, every time I'm in ceremony, when I do my prayers. And anyone can do their morning prayers in that way. I don't think that that is particularly owned by any one nation or culture. It's the expression of how we use our individual um, tasks, or whether we use uh, or whether you decide to simply light a candle in the morning and some incense and be grateful for the day. We start our day with gratitude. We start our day with acknowledging what is truly important, especially today, which is the safeguarding of water and air. So That's when we, you were going to say? Uh, absolutely the water and the air absolutely key you know um bl blessings on them and appreciation and yeah it's like the the toxicity levels on our planet are going up and to appreciate the purity and the clarity of these elements while we have them exactly and also to remember that all those same elements are what makes up our body mm -hmm. So if we honor those elements, not only with our breath and our prayers, um, honor ourselves, mm. because we're made up of that. Everything that, that we are comes from the earth, comes from those sacred elements. That brings us together as relatives. Yes. So when I am offering these prayers, I'm reminded that we're all related. And if we're all related, that aren't we called to treat each other as relatives that that is one of the challenges that i'm seeing more and more here in the united states the mm. reminder that we're all related mm. we're interdependent mm. we're not truly separate from each other whatever i do is going to ripple out to affect all all beings all people at some point Absolutely. so that is why it's important to start the day with prayer and with some form of ritual that will ground you, center you, and prepare you for the day of, ahead. Mm -hmm. Wise, wise words, Grace, thank you so much. Um, we're really looking forward to you visiting the New Forest in June. June the, no, June the 11th is your um, event at the Bur Burley Manor. 
which is happening just after Ken Cohen, who is your husband. Right. He's doing the <laughs> Yi, Yi Chuan uh, Qigong. It's going to be quite an amazing week. And would you just give us a little overview as to what people can look forward to an evening with you? Well, I, you know, I leave it a little fluid because every, every relative who comes to listen, to sit with us when we're in this platica, the sacred heart to heart conversation, it's always a little bit different, but most people want to hear, how did I, how was I called to this path of curanderismo? What was it that I've experienced? What how did I, how did I do this? How did I come about to, to be doing what I'm doing? So I'm going to really go into more detail as to, because it's a teaching in itself, I want to say. It's not because I want to talk about myself, but rather that I see it as a teaching. I see it as something to share with people who are on their own journey so that they also know that they're not alone with what they're experiencing. I think that's really important. So I'm going to talk about um, the dreams that I had starting at age, I don't know, six or seven, um, calling me to this path. Um, my experiences with my mom, my aunties, especially one of my aunts who really was um, a curandera from my perspective. She really did really challenging spiritual work and deserves that name. Talk a little bit about that, that background. Uh, talk about the philosophy, uh, a little bit of cosmology of how my particular practice, how that informs my particular practice, those, the, that philosophy, particular philosophy. Um, if, and if hopefully there'll be time because I really want to, sh since we don't have a PowerPoint, and usually when I do presentations like this, these platicas, I like to do a little bit of storytelling and some visuals through a PowerPoint. So that's going to be a little tricky because, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to see some of the images when I speak about Donancin and Guadalique as Mother Earth and how she is envisioned or was envisioned by our early ancestors and the philosophy behind that. It's, a, it's, it's such a vast topic, but I'm going to try and keep it to that what, hour and a half, two hours and uh, end it with a, uh, asking a volunteer to... Um, to join me and I will be doing an, an egg limpia. And an egg limpia, first of all, let me explain that a limpia is a, a cleansing, literally a spiritual cleansing. Mm -hmm. And an egg, a raw egg is used to shift and extract energy. It's a form of, it's a healing ceremony. And so I'm going to be doing that uh, so that that person can feel the, the experiencing that just particular healing ritual and that people can see how that is done, uh, because I would imagine that most people in the UK probably have never experienced it or seen it, and I think that would be a lovely way to share some medicine and some culture there. Oh, wow, thank you. This sounds very exciting and informative. I'm so looking forward to it. So, Grace, have you got one piece of advice to leave listeners and viewers with before we close up tea time for this episode? goes back to your daily practice in the morning, prayer. Prayer, gratitude, gratitude for all that you have. Gratitude for water, every glass of water, every shower, every bath, swimming, all of that, all the water that flows through our bodies, through our brains, through our hearts, through the breast milk, how we feed our children, how we're born in water. So remember all of that when you are waking up and starting off your day to be grateful for all those beautiful things that make up who you are and who all of us are and do your part that day to acknowledge that in a very practical manner. So if that means that you're going to help someone who is protecting water in your particular area, do so, whether it's financial help or whether it's actually being out there, and I think a, a good reminder for everyone, including myself, is to do your best to be kind and tender to one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that can be quite a challenge and we need more of that. We do. 
Oh, wise, wise words. Thank you so much. Grace Sesma has just been sharing so much of her wisdom on, with us on Chi Time. How can people find out more about you and what you do? Thank you. They can go to my website, which is um, gracesesma.com. And go on, I'm on Facebook, Curanderismo, The Healing Art of Mexico. In fact, I'm really looking forward to meeting some people who are, who are on my Curanderismo Facebook page. They've already indicated they're going to Burley Manor. So I'm looking forward to, to meeting all of you in person, finally. So yeah. that'll be lovely. That will be, because you are internationally known. And we are just absolutely thrilled that you're coming over to the UK. And if you'd like to find out yeah, more about that or get your tickets, then go over to consciouslivingevents.co.uk and we will help you find just what you need to be able to get there. So thank you again, Grace, for, for your time here. Thank you, Clara. Thank you're you. Very, you're so welcome. And safe journeys until we meet again. Yes, see you soon. Take care. Love, thank you so much.